Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Development Review Commission for the City of Tempe for June 8th, 2021. The Development Review Commission is created to hold public meetings and hearings to provide analysis and recommendations to the City Council regarding general land use policies and applications with Commission as recommendatory power and to render final decisions on specified applications where the Commission has final decision making power including, but not limited to, all aspects of a proposed and future development. The Development Review Commission recognizes that the creation of a desirable environment throughout the city for residents, business, and industry is a prime requisite for the interdependence of land values, aesthetics, and good site planning by promoting harmonious, safe, attractive, and compatible development that is therefore considered to be in the best interest of public health, safety, and general welfare. Now, any person aggrieved by a final decision of the Development Review Commission may file an appeal to the City Council within 14 calendar days after the Development Review Commission has rendered its decision. Now, having said that, let me introduce who we have with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, by way of City staff, we have Ms. Saparna Dasgupta, Mr. Steve Abramson, Ms. Diana Kaminsky, we have Lee Jimenez, Karen Stovall, Dalton Guerra, Joanna Berry, and Mr. Jason Wolf joining us. In our commission tonight, we have with us Commissioner Andrew Johnson, Commissioner Don Cassano, uh, we have Commissioner Michelle Schwartz joining us, Commissioner Philip Amorosi, Commissioner Scott Sumners, Commissioner Stephen Bauer, and I am Chairman David Lyons. Now, uh, the First item of business for consideration, we have reviewed meeting minutes from the April 27th meeting, uh, April 27th, 2021. Uh, Commissioner Sumner's pointed out one revision to be made to a case number. Other than that, we have found no revisions to be made. Commission, can we hear a motion regarding the approval of those meeting minutes? Mr. Chairman, this is Commissioner Cassano. I would make a motion for approval of Development Review Commission Study Session 427-2021 and the Development Review Commission Regular Meeting of 427-2021 with the uh, correction. Fair enough. Do I hear a second? Second, Phil Amorosi. Okay. Motion to approve from Commissioner Cassano with the revision noted and seconded by Commissioner Amorosi. Commissioner Bauer, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Cassano. Aye. Commissioner Schwartz. Aye. I vote aye as well. Commissioner Sumners. Aye. Commissioner Amorosi. Aye. And Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Okay. Motion passes 7 0. Thank you, Commission. And for what it's worth, I appreciate now that. Uh, the order in which I call on you to vote is not alphabetical or I'm not sure what the order is based on other than the word document I have, that's the order in which we're listed. So if that's confusing to you, don't worry about it. That's just my little thing that I'm doing here. All right, so let's move on. Our consent agenda for tonight, folks, we've elected to place two of our cases on this consent agenda. Uh, these are items that we intend to approve without further discussion because we believe that they meet the satisfactory criteria, that meet the criteria satisfactorily, let's say it that way. Um, those two items on our consent agenda tonight are Lumberjacks Axe Throwing and the Smith Residence. And uh, we did not receive any comment from public wishing to discuss the cases, so we're going to go ahead and move on with our consent agenda as written. Um, can I hear a motion regarding the approval of that consent agenda, please? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Cassano, I make a motion for approval of the con uh, consent agenda. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. Johnson. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. All right, motion to approve from Commissioner Cassano, seconded by Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Bauer, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Cassano. Aye. Commissioner Schwartz. Aye. Okay, I vote aye as well. Commissioner Summers. Aye. Commissioner Amorosi. Aye. And Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Okay, motion passes 7-0. Thank you, Commissioner. So, 
Let's move on now. I know we have substantial interest in our next case. Let me announce the, the order of the rest of our cases while I'm at it. We will hear in order Price and Baseline Roads, followed by Millhouse on Apache. So, uh, beginning with Price and Baseline Road, uh, Price and Baseline Roads. Miss um, Manjula Vaz, are you prepared with uh, with your presentation? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I yes I am. Um, I think Jason. As you, ever. <laughs> as ever. Um, I think of busy Jason, night for you as well. Busy busy night. Actually, uh, Rob is going to do the next one, so I'm only doing this one. All right. All right. Uh, well, give us what you got. Okay. There you go. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for members of the Commission, for your record, my name is Manjula Vaz with the law firm of Gammage and Burnham, 40 North Central Phoenix 85004. I'm here today on behalf of Trammell Crow Residential. With me from Trammell Crow are Carl Hershey and Matt Ensler, as well as Doug Sexton, who is our architect from Todd and Associates. We have Chuck Wright from Kimberly Horn, um, Don Cartier from Civtech. And then, of course, Rob Lane from my office. And we're all happy to answer any questions. I know this case has had a lot of um, participation. And we have tried to also do some participation with the community. So I will go through our case, the changes we've made, and then we can talk about some of the other issues. Uh, next slide, please, Jason. As I mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Trammell Crow Residential. Trammell Crow is a pioneer in the kind of multifamily development space with over 250,000 premier multifamily residences. Uh, next slide. This is just a couple of pictures of some of the different Trammell Crow projects, couple in, um, in te Texas, sorry, and then one in Colorado and Atlanta just to show you tech quality that Trammell Crow builds in three and four story different developments and different architectural styles. Next slide, please. The site itself, I think you are all familiar with it, is an eight acre site at the northwest corner of Baseline and the 101 um, Price Freeway. The site has been, I think we know, retail, um, some kind of neighborhood retail over the years. With the Price Freeway, all of the, um, this site has struggled along with a lot of corners adjacent to the 101. And I think you know, over the last 15 or 20 years, well, certainly the last 10 years, you've seen kind of the redevelopment of these corners. But this site has certainly had a variety of different tenants over the last, you know, couple of years. And so the, this retail without kind of a window um, where you have people slowing down and going to it is, is a hard, hard to make retail work there. And the retail on baseline is kind of moving to, is at basically McClintock and baseline. So this site has struggled, so we are proposing to redevelop this site as multifamily re residential and, and reinvest kind of in this corner uh, without a residential product would be is something that is similar to kind of the surrounding area and also provides a good transition buffer from the RTL streets at the freeway. Next slide, please. Just to give you just a couple, I think we've seen about existing site conditions. The top two slides, well, slides one and three, are pictures of the existing site. And then two and four down here are the adjacent, the adjacent road of Bala. And then just the, uh, you can see the adjacent road in the western edge of our site. Next slide, please. Our, we have four applications that I just want to talk a little bit about. We have a general plan amendment to change from the site PCC1, which is a site density plan commercial center, allows residential density of what the city terms as median density. So with a use permit right now, the site would, could, you know, you could propose to get 15 dwelling units the acre. What we're proposing is what this general plan calls medium to high density, which I would more likely call medium high density, up to 25 dwelling units an acre. Um, it's certainly not, just for the audience, it's not the high density that you would see in the northern part of Tempe or even the north of Baseline. But the kind of 12, 25 dwellings to the acre is something that's similar to the other multifamily projects, which I'll talk about along baseline, including <laughs> the San Marquis apartments next to the Lowe's that you see at, at baseline, kind of in rural and college, that area, and then the Harper at Lake Country Village. 
Um, we're asking for a zoning amendment to rezone the site from PCC1 to R4, as I mentioned, the PAD for site-specific development standards, and then DPR. Next slide, please. Um, just very briefly, some pictures that just show you kind of projected land use over time, and certainly these corners have been commercial. Our thought is to, to change that land use to residential, which we thought matches with the surrounding residential uses. That little square in the corner is the tennis court uh, that belongs to Continental Bellas, which is not changing. Next slide, please. And then just really briefly, just a slide that shows you the change in zoning from PCC1, as I mentioned, to the R4 PAD. And then the adjacent single family next to us is zoned R14. Next slide, please. Just to talk about a little bit about it. When we kind of went through the kind of we, what we've really tried to do has been sensitive to the design of this development. So what we're proposing is kind of a high quality multifamily development where you have buildings that range from one to four stories. Along the western edge, which I'll show you, you have one and two story buildings. We're trying to match kind of all excuse me, the development to the west, um, and then you have kind of the higher edge, the taller buildings along the east side, three-story and four-story at the corner. We have 200 units, 10 studios, 91 bedrooms, 86 twos, 14 three-bedrooms, leasing office. Um, this says we have 332 vehicle parking spaces. We, we are actually increasing that to 355 parking spaces, which I'll talk about. Um, that includes 40 GEFs parking spaces, and 200 covered parking spaces. We have 144 bike parking spaces, but I think importantly, we have 34% landscape area, which is greater than R4 requires for 25%, and the site only has 25%, 20, sorry, 27% lot coverage, which you know from seeing other projects, and certainly I brought to you, you've seen in the course of the commission, so that's a pretty low suburban lot coverage versus what you might see in other developments. Next slide, please. So just to talk a little bit about kind of what I've mentioned, the, what we've tried to do and trying to be very sensitive to the way the site is developed. Along the western edge, we have a kind of a one-story leasing office going from the south and going north. And then we've placed kind of two-story buildings on the western edge, um, adjacent to the one and two-story kind of continental villas, which is similar to kind of in the height there. Then we've placed, tried to provide kind of a buffer along our eastern edge. And our thought was to try, we thought that the height would work to kind of provide a, maybe a sound barrier and a buffer adjacent to the freeway. We'll place three-story buildings kind of on the northern edge, which I'll show you a little bit about. And then we have a four-story building at the corner edge along baseline and price to kind of give a little height and then to provide a sound barrier. The other thing you may not be able to see exactly, but we've done a couple of things that thought are interesting. We have you know, it's a dog park within the development. We also have a turf area that functions um, on the southern edge as a yoga lawn. Certainly a lot of landscaping. Then the um, units along Bala here, so on the western edge, Jason to Bala, all have private backyards. So the units along Bala and then the units on the first floor of Long Price have private backyards to give more kind of a townhouse feeling, um, give you more amenity space. It's hard to see, but there are little backyard, private backyards there. Um, so we, what we tried to do is make sure that there are, this is a highly amenitized community, that who, people who live here have open, ample walking space, ample amenities, um, and can really enjoy the area and won't be necessarily wandering all over uh, the adjacent neighborhoods. Next slide, please. And then just to give you a little bit of it's a little complicated slide, but just to maybe talk a little bit about the height. PCC1 allows 35 feet by right as a maximum height. And so even though we're changing the zoning, I just wanted to give you a sense of what's allowed there in terms of height and kind of what we thought through as we were doing some height. So along again, along the western edge, the building heights at the top of the play, in the top two building heights of two stories, basically 20 feet, as you can see here. So the top of the building, the parapet's 28, four, but you know, lower than certainly allowed if this was redeveloped as an office or something to, the, to that effect. And then as you go north, this three-story building that there's a tip at the northern tip of that three-story building, which is the closest to the residence from the north, we do not, those units do not have any north-facing windows at that location. So what 
there's a wall, the, res, the people who are closest to the residents of the north will not be able to look to the north through a window. The closest windows um, on the three-story buildings that we do have are approximately, I think, 164 feet from the residents to the north as they look north, and we'll show you some pictures. I mean, obviously, there's park covered parking between that and then some uh, trees, uh, which I'm going to have our Doug's going to talk a little bit about the heights of the trees, but that, Doug can correct me, but I believe they're going to be 8 and 10 feet as they're currently planted, 20 feet on center. So we've really tried to both buffer the site and try to put the height away from the neighborhood. And then as you come down, put the height at the corner um, along the four story. You can kind of see the four story plate at 42 feet. And one of the reasons we did that, um, as you'll see, is you kind of travel up and down the, um, the 101. You do see a little bit of height um, along the 101, both going north and south. This is shorter than you know, the four-story office building at Elliott, but we thought it was a, it would, it's both a good buffer and a, and a nice architectural feature. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Sexton, who is our architect, and he's gonna walk you through the design a little bit. Doug. Angela, this building is our four-story building. It's on the southeast corner of uh, Price and Great Baseline. Um, it's our tallest building, and it's the farthest one away from the neighborhoods that we could get. Uh, we've done um, designed a contemporary building with a little bit of postmodern flair. You'll see in another slide or two we have some angled roofs uh, that help add interest, as well as we have um, uh, established a uh, base material at the bottom of the building that's a darker color, as well as integral colored concrete block. Uh, that concrete block is carried up to the top of the fourth floor balconies in some locations to help break up the mass of the building and to add additional texture and color and interest. We have uh, composite wood tone lap siding. Uh, along the roadways, we have uh, extensive plantings of trees that will help soften that edge and make it a more pedestrian friendly uh, experience and also help shade those walkways. Next slide, please. In this view, we're looking back at the uh, one-story building, the leasing building. It's on the southwest corner of Baseline and Bala Drive. Uh, the wall you see there on the left is the existing masonry wall that is actually owned by the Homeowners Association. That wall will remain as is uh, we don't plan on, uh, we're not able to do anything with it, nor will we try to. Uh, the leasing building itself is a uh, one story building, and there's uh, one of the angled roofs that you see that we talked about. Um, we have another uh, element on the high building to reflect that uh, same kind of pitch in the roof to add interest to those buildings as well. That uh, roofing material will be a standing seam metal roof, so they'll have some color and add another. Um, uh, material interest to the project. Um, that landscaping along baseline in front of the, the leasing office in front of the four-story building, again, um, a number of trees have been planted there to help soften that edge, as well as some turf panels and shrubbery along the right-of-way there. Uh, and as you enter into the um, vehicular entrance into the, into the site. Next slide, please. This view is actually from across the street on Donner, uh, looking across Bala Drive towards the two-story building. Uh, you see the existing wall that is there. This is actually a photograph that was included in the rendering, and the scale is appropriate. Um, the building, uh, our building is the two-story building behind. Uh, again, is screened with uh, shade trees that will be uh, planted along that um, inside of the fenced area to provide shade for the, uh, get the, the residents that live on the first floor and this also on the second floor, as well as screen the project as much as possible from uh, the neighborhood to the west. You can see the use of the composite wood siding there along with um, the angled roofs that we have used on a couple of the buildings to help add interest to those. Uh, uh, articulated buildings. Next slide, please. This slide is taken from across the alley to the north 
from a resident's backyard. This is what it would look like um, after a couple of years when the trees have a chance to mature. Uh, those will get to be about 25, 35 feet tall and they're planted about 20 feet apart, which is pretty close for trees of these sizes. Additionally, you'll see parking canopies, uh, um, if you can, between uh, the, build, the trees, the, the northern property line and the, and the three story building that's south of the parking canopies and the parking lot. Uh, that building is, um, the third story is, is about 22 feet, so eye level at that building is going to be in the neighborhood of uh, 24, 25 feet above ground. And I don't see that there's going to be a lot of visibility into the neighbor's backyards once these elements are um, built and the trees have matured. Those trees are um, hybrid willow trees, acacias, and then we also have a few hybrid olive trees planted along there in between. And then uh, additionally, there's some eucalyptus trees planted in some of those landscape islands that are planted along that northern parking lot. Next slide, please. I'll turn it back over to Manjula now. Yeah, th thank you, Doug. Um, I'm going to go through just a couple of ac slides related to the site access. Um, I know you've seen a lot of comments about the site access. One of the, the site itself currently has seven different curb cuts, four along price and three on baseline. Um, the, we are closing all the curb cuts except for one on price and one on baseline. ADOT is also requiring us to extend the median along baseline to Bala, so which, which basically cuts off um, any access for traffic that is coming from the west going east on baseline to make the left into the site. So one of the first alternatives we had was that you could then, for traffic coming, we think most traffic will be coming certainly along price to enter going north, south, either entering off the entrance on price or entering off the entrance, making the right and entering on baseline. To the extent people are coming back from the west, going east, this, in this alternative, they would drive up Bala and then go head east on a east-west street and go down on price. Uh, we heard certainly a lot of comments that we, they didn't want traffic in the neighborhood. So we have different alternatives, but I just wanted to show you this one. And just to give you a little sense, right now, um, during the AM peak hour, there are 10 vehicles that go north on Bala from baseline and 14 during the PM peak. We believe, check right can certainly answer, that post-development, there'll be additional six going north in this scenario during the AM peak and then additional 21 during the PM peak. Next slide, please, Jason. This is just an alternative, which I won't spend a lot of time on, but we had talked to early on to talk to the Homeowners Association about having some access on Bala, which would give us a one-way access into the site. This uh, option was rejected, but just wanted to say that we did consider this option. Next slide. The, then this is an option um, which allows us to extend the median past Bala and basically cut off access for development traffic going north on Bala. And so what you see on this base, on this site, you have traffic coming from the west going east. We'll have a protected left turn lane in, and we'll be able to have the direct access into the site. This will cut off people from going into on Bala. Um, and then ex next slide, I can show you a little bit of, please, Jason. There you go. So I don't know if you can see this, maybe a little small bit. The, what you can, these, the, if you can see these turning radius down here, people would be able to, obviously coming off the freeway, head west. If you're heading west and going east, you will then come into the protected lane. You can either go north into the site, or there's actually, since there are three lanes, I think I mentioned, you will not be able to make a U-turn. We've actually determined with the city that you will be able to make a U-turn, so you can make that U-turn and then head north into, onto Bala. So then if, so that, is the access that prevents any access from the project going north onto Bala. All access will stay on baseline. Use a new median that we will construct, or this new alternative we will construct that will keep traffic just on baseline going north. In addition, if people are coming, want to make a left from Bala, I've heard that a couple of times, 
there is an option where they would either make the left off river and then go east or you can go around the median if you're coming from bala you would make a right go west go around the median and then make the u-turn to go left but that is the media that's the option that's the most restricted in this um, alternative but we think this alternative there's a lot of people going left off of bala but it does it does create a way so that we create we do reopen an access to the site from baseline without entering the neighborhood. Next slide, Jason. And the fourth alternative is an alternative that allows what I've just mentioned. You do have a protected left going into the site. You also have a protected left coming from Bala, and then you can come Bala, make a left, and then make that U-turn in a protected manner and go east on baseline. Um, we've had a neighborhood meeting showing these three alternatives. Uh, the city and ADOT are still working through the alternatives um, with the community. We are happy, we are neutral on the alternatives, happy to kind of work with all of them. I, I would say in talking with the, the uh, property owners to the south, and talking to some of the other residents, I think the third alternative is probably maybe a little ahead in terms of kind of what everybody would prefer, but we are still working through that. But certainly uh, we'll continue to work through it. But I think there are some options to try to help manage the traffic and make sure we have an access on baseline. Next slide. And I just wanted to talk really briefly about PCC zoning and have Chuck talk a little bit about traffic. Just very briefly, as I mentioned, the maximum building height currently allowed on that side is 35 feet under the current zoning. Um, it does allow 15 units per acre with a use permit and the maximum lot coverage allowed on that side by right is 50%. So what we have tried to do is we were working through the site while well, we are rezoning it, but we were being sensitive to the current zoning, um, underlying zoning, and we have our maximum lot coverage is 27%, so a little, a little more than half, but certainly less than allowed under PCC1. We've tried to keep most of those buildings under 35 feet. And then give you a sense of what could be allowed under PCC zoning, certainly general retail sales, uh, you know, grocery store, clinics, a commercial office, fitness center, so, so both those things which certainly could generate a lot more traffic than we believe this multifamily community will generate. Next slide. And in fact, talking about that, I'm gonna have Chuck Wright, our traffic engineer, to talk a little bit about kind of traffic generated from multifamily and what's allowed shopping center. Um, Chuck. Uh, Jason, can you go back one slide and Chuck will talk about traffic. There you go. Thank you. Chuck. Monja Live, I muted him, but I don't know if he's also calling in on a phone line. Okay, well, I'll just talk about this briefly, then Chuck will pop up and we can answer Chuck during questions. Um, this is just to give you a sense of multifamily residential development. If you quantity of when we have 200 units, and you have a daily trip total of 1464, um, which is at the AM peak. It's a little higher than what you would see as you see at the shopping center. We just did the shopping center. If the shopping center was fully leased, you would have maybe a little less in the AM peak, but you'd certainly have more trips in the PM peak. But overall, commercial, I think we know, office, shopping center generate twice as many trips as this kind of this multifamily development. So that's to give you a sense of the traffic in and out of. Um, in terms of the trip generation versus multifamily versus the shopping center. And certainly also if it was office that you see kind of up and down the 101. Next slide, please. And then very briefly, just so I know you've seen, I just want to show you a couple of other projects that you've certainly seen on baseline. One is the Harper to give you a comparison. The Harper has more units than we do, more acreage, but same density. These are all three stories. Um, lot coverage is about the same. But to give you a sense of what we've tried to do is try to kind of scale up the heights versus these are all three stories. And then the next site, next slide, please. And then the San Marquis Apartments, which I talked about next to the Lowe's, is, has about 224 units, 10 acres. Again, all three stories. Lot coverage is about the same. Landscape area a little higher. Next slide, please. And then just, just to show you a couple of projects and heights along the 101 in terms of how the fourth story, what we envision the 
These are all taller than our four story at the corner, but just to give you a sense of what's going, I think you know what's going on along the 101, both Metro 101 to the source, but certainly much more dense. And then kind of the office that in the office in the hotel that's happening along Elliott at the 101. Next slide. And then our parking. So what was, as Saparna mentioned, we were able to increase our parking number to from 320, 322 to 355 spaces. That includes 40 vehicle spaces. Um, and I think this, and th that is because we originally had the parking spaces larger than the city requires. And under this parking ratio, we will now have one parking space per bedroom or 1.75 spaces per unit. And so we think it's a little less than, I think the city wanted 362, I think we're off by seven, but I mean, from a parking ratio in terms of, I don't, we don't anticipate having a person per bedroom needing a car. And so um, we've got this, I think the staff supports it, so I can talk about it, but this is a, we were able to find more parking spaces. What we would see in this corridor is young professionals. I mean, there's a lot of jobs, as we all know, both north and south on the 101. And there you have a lot of young professionals, whether they're, you know, going to be working there, working a little bit at home. You have people in a two bedroom who have, you know, two yeah. people in a bedroom and then maybe office or one person in an office. So I think from that standpoint, I think this is something that we and the staff agree upon. Next slide, please. And these are these are the conditions to that will implement the increased parking. Um, the first condition is that we need to add that statement in blue related to our PAD, so that we include the updated product project data accounting for mass, maximum vehicle space. Um, the next condition is to revise condition number four, which had development shall provide a maximum vehicle parking deficit of 37 versus 30 from the staff standpoint. And then I think one more slide, Chuck, that had to do with the DPR condition does the same thing. Next slide. I'm not, Jason, sorry, not Chuck, sorry. Jason, so uh, the last condition modified the condition related to modifying the site landscape plans consistent with the revisions that we've shown you. Um, all of these three relate to uh, changes, increasing the parking number. Next slide, I believe that so then lastly, just to outreach, um, we've had spent, we've had three meetings with the Continental Villas board um, last year, over the course of last year in 2020. And then we've had three neighborhood meetings um, in 2021. Next slide. And with that, that concludes my presentation. I appreciate your time and listening. Um, any of us are happy to answer questions. I think Chuck is back on the line, so. You can certainly sure. answer any questions as you need. All right. Um, as you may know, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have time for public comment a little later. For right now, let's do commission questions. Um, I see Don Cassano and Phil Amorosi. Uh, Commissioner Cassano? Uh, Commissioner Cassano, you are on mute. Yes, I, my hand was up by mistake. I see. That, that was Sorry. left over. Sorry. Gotcha. Commissioner Amorosi, do you have a question? Well, thank you, Chairman Lyon. Uh, Manjula, I just wanted to know, as far as the uh, pricing of the units, uh, are we looking at workforce? Are we looking at market rate? Are we looking at luxury? What's the um, breakdown down here? Are we going to see anything for uh, our lower end citizens? Uh. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Amorosi, we are looking at market rate apartments. Um, the project will be contributing to the Hometown for All program uh, with the mayor. So we have already talked to the mayor. We will be contributing to the Hometown for All program. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Bauer. Uh, Chairman, uh, Ms. Vaz, where does the city's review of the two uh, median pocket designs stand at this point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Barrow, and I, I believe Kathy Hall is here. We we have talked to both the city of Tempe and ADOT. Um, we have approval. I mean, you know, generally approval from ADOT for 
a, the alternative three. And I think we've worked with them on alternative four. Fire and police are fine with both alternatives. I mean, I think we have preliminary approval on, let's call it both alternatives. Uh, we were trying to get some sense of the community as to which the community would prefer. The, the dual left pond design, which is, I just saw it for the first time tonight. I saw a letter of support from the uh, condominium association across the street on the south side of Baseline Road in support of this single uh, yeah. left hand pocket and the extension of the median pass bala. Um, have you had an opportunity to speak with that association about a dual left pocket, which I believe would eliminate their ability to turn left on Baseline Road from that condominium property? I believe. I'm not sure that's the case. Uh, that, Commissioner Bauer, that is correct. I mean, it would it would eliminate it. They would have to. I have first to answer your first question. I have spoken with them. They would prefer alternative three. Um, they can't make that direct left. They would have to kind of make a right and go around. But yes, so they would prefer alternative three. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any other questions for our applicant? All right, seeing none, we'll thank you for the moment, Ms. Voss, and thank you. we will ask Ms. Karen Stovall to frame the issue from the city's point of view. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Um, I will wait for the staff PowerPoint to be put up. Mute on. Thank you, Jason. Um, Whoops, wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> if you can click on the price and baseline PowerPoint. Thank you. Uh, if you could go ahead and go to the, oh. Think back to the applicant's presentation. I'm sorry, this it's a PDF. It's difficult to locate specific pages. What page number did you ask for? Um, let's see. It would be 20. All right, stand by one moment, please. Thank you. Jason, if you make sure that it's the city's uh, PowerPoint as opposed to the applicant PowerPoint. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think that one is in PowerPoint. Thank you. All right. Um, so again, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Karen Stovall, Senior Planner. Um, so this project is located at 2160 East Baseline Road, which is at the northwest corner of Price and Baseline. The property is currently zoned PCC1 and contains a commercial center. Um, on the west side of the site, the adjacent homeowners association does own a 10-foot wide landscape track that prevents access to the site from Bala. The applicant is um, requesting approval of a general plan amendment from commercial to residential, a general plan density map amendment from up to 15 dwelling units per acre to up to 25 dwelling units per acre, a zoning map amendment from PCC1 to R4, a planned area development overlay to modify the R4 district development standards, and a development plan review for a site plan, building elevations, and a landscape plan. You could please go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so the proposal is to demolish the existing commercial center and construct an apartment complex containing 200 dwelling units. The requested PAD overlay includes a maximum building height of 59 feet compared to the maximum 40 foot height allowed in the underlying R4 zoning district. And the applicant has already explained how the 
building heights are lower on the west side and north side closer to the existing town homes and then go up to four stories at the corner of uh, price and baseline. Also as part of the PAD, the applicant is requesting alternative parking ratios to determine the, the um, required vehicle parking. Uh, 392 vehicle spaces are required by code. The plans that were in the attachments proposed 332 spaces. And again, the applicant is um, proposing modifications to the site plan to get up to 355. If you could please go to the landscape plan. Thank you. Um, the existing six foot wall that is within the 10 foot track owned by the homeowners association that runs along the west property line around the tennis courts and then along the alley on the north end of the site would remain in place. And then along price the applicant proposes a six foot high masonry wall and um, along baseline a masonry wall, a three foot masonry wall with view fencing on top. Um, please next slide and you can actually go through all the elevations and go to the neighborhood meeting slide. I think the applicant did a pretty good job explaining all of those. There you go, thank you. Um, a neighborhood meeting was required for these requests and the applicant held the first of three virtual meetings in January of this year and then proceeded to hold two more meetings in April and May with the intent of receiving um, additional community input on the project's design, access, and the design of the median and baseline. There were concerns expressed by the public. Those included increased traffic and accidents in the area, use of local streets for site access, a shortage of on-site parking, which might spill over into the adjacent townhome subdivision, downgrading of property values, um, children having to cross baseline to get to the school because the one on the north side is closed, um, desire for to see uh, revitalization of the existing center and a desire for more affordable housing or home ownership opportunities. In total, staff received 18 emails, eight phone calls and a petition in opposition and also three emails in support. Most of the written communication is included in the report attachments, although correspondence that was received after publishing the report was forwarded to the commissioners this afternoon. If you could please go to the next slide. Thank you. Staff is recommending approval of the five requests subject to the conditions of approval that are listed in the staff report. Um, there are two unique conditions. The first one would be to provide a maximum 30 space uh, parking deficit versus the 60 spaces um, that were proposed. And this is to address the concerns expressed by the neighbors to the west that the project's lack of parking would cause spillover into their community. Um, the applicant has proposed, again, a um, parking space quantity of 355. We would still like to uh, see this go up to 362 um, to be more in line with the other uh, more suburban uh, PADs that were previously mentioned along baseline, um, which would include the San Marquis apartments at Rural and Baseline and San Sonoma um, on Priest South of Warner. The other um, condition is that the use of the 40 required guest parking spaces should remain unrestricted. And that's so that um, guest parking spaces may not be designated for tenant use in the future if, if it does turn out that there's a, sh a shortage. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, Commission. Thank you, Ms. Stovall. Any questions for Ms. Stovall, Commission? Uh, Commissioner Amorosi, please. Thank you, Chairman Lyon. Uh, Ms. Stovall, uh, with I know that uh, if it was this was being built along the TOD, they would have a reduction in parking spaces. How does the 355 spaces compare to uh, if they were along the TOD line? Would that be so, comparable? So um, I have not done the calculations to determine the required parking if this was in the TOD overlay. The applicant um, has provided a parking analysis as part of their attachment. Um, and it might actually be, I might need to defer to them to go through it, um, but their parking analysis does show a comparison of parking spaces per unit um, compared to 
other projects, and those include some of the projects along the TOD. Um, if you'd like to give me a minute, I can find the comparison. So this one, and again, this is a parking per unit based on the applicant's 332 spaces. So um, University Village, which is on Terrace, fronts uh, the light rail, that's at 1.81 um, parking spaces per unit. Um, what else do we have? Um, Grand at Papago, which is on Washington, 1.71 parking spaces per unit. Um, and again, they're proposing 1.66. I haven't done the, the calculations at the 355 again that they've proposed, though. Let me see what that might be. All right. All right. Um, it looks like that might be 1.8. Uh, no, 1.77. Right. <laughs> so, as the applicant has requested to modify the stipulation, it's closer to um, many of the developments that are on the TOD, which we do not believe is appropriate because this is not along the TOD, nor is it near downtown. Right. I was just wondering how it how it would compare. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Other questions for Ms. Stovall? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in with kind of a follow-up, actually. Um, Ms. Stovall, do I understand correctly that the the city sees the project as 37 unit uh, parking spaces short of what you would like to see? The, the number that they currently have? That... So are we speaking of the proposal that the applicant presented to you tonight, not what's in the staff report attachments? Okay, yeah. as proposed tonight, um, they would be at 355 instead of the required 392. We would like them to be at 362. So 30 spaces short instead of 37 spaces short. Okay, so I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. It sounds like the city has already kind of said, well, we can meet you part way. We'd like you to be within 30 of the normal number. Okay, yeah, I'm mean, just a little shy of that. Yes, yes, and, and you know, as the um, condition of approval discussed, there are other options um, that they can take, such as, you know, modifying the unit mix, or reducing the number of dwelling units in order to get that maximum 30 space deficit. Okay, understood. Thank you, Ms. Stovall. Uh, if I don't have any more questions, I think we will thank you and move on to our public comment section. Um, now, folks, as a reminder, uh, we have established the policy for how we accept public comment while we're doing things by way of WebEx. And our standard is we like to receive those comments by four o'clock on the day of the meeting. Um, so keep that in mind if you're intending to comment on future projects. Uh, Ms. Descupta, can you uh, tell us who we've got in public comment? Chairman, uh, would you like me to read the ones that would like to be read on the record first or provide the opportunity for the people who wanna speak first? We have three uh, speakers, or four speakers. Four speakers. Um, I, I think that I'd like to have you read in the comments that we should be read in first, if you would. Okay, sounds good. Um, I will go one by one with these. The first one is Mary Lou Paulson, and opposed to the project. Uh, the, it says the current proposal is wrong for that location. Price is only one way traffic and baseline also has limited access being only one of the of two entrances to the proposed 200 apartment units. Uh, concern from neighbors talked about this issue. The applicant uh, answer on May 20th, Gamage and Burnham said that cars would could go to the next intersection and make a U-turn. This would cause more confusion and traffic issues, causing more accidents, not to mention more traffic on residential streets north of the apartments. 
The proposal calls for 532 parking spaces. This would be a daily nightmare for the neighborhood and the apartment renters. I say no to PL 200239. The next one is Chris Higgins opposed says I live I have lived on South River Drive in Cold Park neighborhood since 1982 I'm opposed to the proposed apartment complex at Price and Baseline Roads which is one block away from my home primarily due to the increased traffic volumes I anticipate occurring on our neighborhood streets particularly the through streets such as Fremont Drive Country Club Drive and River Drive I also believe that the project entrance exit on Baseline Road will cause unsafe conditions and traffic snarling at the already busy intersection. I'm also concerned about with how the addition of the large number of residents at the project will affect the homey feel of our neighborhood. Give me a second, Chairman. My computer is slowing down here. It's giving me some issues for the to move on to the next comment. The next one is Alan Schumacher opposed. Uh, this project is wrong for our neighborhood. It will diminish the value of our neighborhood. Uh, it stuffs too many people into our, uh, it stuffs too many people into our neighborhood. This will negatively impact the character and quality of our neighborhood. Please stop this project now. Next one is Kay Lippitt, opposed. I'm writing to tell you my concern about price and baseline project, uh, the plan to build a multifamily housing complex at that location will be extremely detrimental to the existing established neighborhood. The increased traffic and new traffic patterns will greatly compromise smooth vehicular access to the surrounding neighborhood. In addition, the density and height of the buildings will drastically change the character of the neighborhood and greatly reduce property values. An alternate, alternative plan for a lower density mixed use development would be better blend in with the existing environment. In addition, it would allow a long time family owned business uh, that has thrived in this location for over 30 years through many ups and downs, including the current pandemic to remain in business as the cornerstone of our neighborhood. I urge you to reject the rezoning proposal and not allow a development of the four story complex at this location. The next one uh, chairman is Kathy Rourke opposed. My family and I have lived in Cold Park neighborhood since 1972. I have seen many changes during the 49 years. When the Loop 101 freeway was completed, it became very difficult to enter or leave the neighborhood from the east. Prior to construction, we could make either a right or left and turn into, the, into Price Road, I believe. An in-depth study of the Traffic patterns at the price and baseline intersection and within the Cold Park neighborhood will be will reveal potentially serious uh, serious issues with the traffic flow, especially on Fremont. I'm also absolutely opposed uh, being able to see four story apartment building from my back patio. The homeowners is in the Cold Park com community have a vested interest in the quality of life. Uh, in this area, it seems unlikely that apartment renters will have the same interest. The property at baseline and price should be used for the purpose that will, it will uh, maintain and enhance the life we enjoy in our neighborhood. 
The next one is Shelly Tunis. Um, opposed. Uh, I opposed a, pri a proposed pr pri price and baseline apartment development and the request for the amendment to the general plan and zoning map not to be approved. There are too many unresolved health and safety issues involved involving the access on Bala Drive and proposed U-turn access points that will adversely affect the um, Continental um, Villas 3 townhomes as the Cole Park neighborhood. There are a few parking spaces for the size of the complex causing undue burden on the Continental uh, Villas East neighborhood. This proposal, proposal does not uh, do nothing to remedy Tempe's affordable housing issue. In fact, this proposal will have rents that are not affordable for seniors, multi-generational multi families, and young families. Number four, this proposal place, places more density in the area that will result in more traffic problems for an area that already has access difficulty uh, due to the US 60 and 101 free freeways. I have submitted additional comments about the proposal apartment complex that further illustrates my concerns. And then I have the, this is the last one, Chairman, and it's from Candace Toller. Um, please adhere to the tenants of the Kiwanis Lake character area, focus new housing enhancement of housing choices and design over a number of units. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving on to those who wish to speak, uh, let me just uh, remind everyone that we uh, like to provide three minutes for you to speak. I'll be sort of keeping a loose track on that. And if I ask you to wrap things up, uh, please be considerate of everyone else's time and, and give us kind of your, your last sentence and, and thank you and have a seat kind of thing. Um, so with that, Ms. Dasgupta, who do we have? Chairman, we have four speakers. Uh, the first one is, uh, with, that was, I, I'll go in the order that it was submitted, um, but the, it's, uh, the first one is supposed to be Richard Schwab. We don't see his name on the call, but there are other callers, so I'm not sure if he is on the line because we can't see their phone numbers. Ah, uh, and I assume everyone is muted and there's not a good way to see which uh, one Joanna might, might be Richard. Joanna cannot mute um, them all, Chairman. Uh, we yes. only have, I'm sorry, Chairline, we only have two people that are calling users. One was Doug Sexton, so I know that's I just gonna kind of unmute the other one if you want to check to see if that's Mr. Schwab. Let's do that. Let's find okay. out. Okay, right now. Okay, it's unmuted. Okay. Um, do we have Richard Schwab with us by way of phone call? Okay, so I'm not hearing anything. So I assume that the person on that phone number is not Richard Schwab. Okay, Chairman, the next person, we can come back again later, but the next person is uh, Elizabeth Grosh. Yes, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Gross. Okay, thank you. I just uh, appreciate the information we've been given so far. What I've noticed in the initial presentation today was the extensive traffic studies on baseline price and bala i represent or am a member of the coal park neighborhood and we're concerned for traffic coming in from the fremont area the fremont road and what i heard in the presentation is traffic coming from going north and south on the 101, but I didn't hear any studies being done on traffic exiting off of the 60 from off of uh, McClintock or perhaps from Dobson. So I haven't heard any kind of east and west traffic impact. My thought 
and several of our neighbors seem to agree on this, is traffic coming in from Phoenix often would come off of the 60 and then exit on to McClintock, with McClintock having been reduced from three lanes southbound, is now two lanes southbound, and often in the winter months of high traffic, we get a big backup there from the freeway exit to baseline. A lot of people seem to cut through into Fremont to get into the neighborhood instead of going all the way around to get to the east side or the east houses of this neighborhood. My question then is, were traffic studies conducted um, on Fremont and Price and Baseline, and were they conducted in 2020 during a pandemic when a lot of people were asked to stay home or needed to work from home? And how does that calculate into any kind of typical traffic pattern um, that would be considered for this uh, apartment complex going in with a minimum of 362 cars. The other question I have is, were traffic studies conducted then in 2019? And if so, what months in 2019 were they done? Were they done in the summer? Or were they done in the winter? Where in the winter we have a lot more traffic due to a lot of winter visitors. Those are my questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Gross. Thank we'll uh, come back to our applicant and ask for those questions, uh, ask for those answers, rather. All right, Ms. Dasgupta, who else do we have? Uh, Joanna, do we have Mr. Tom Hoover? Yes, I just unmuted him. Thank you. I'm on. Okay, Mr. Hoover, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. I can barely can hear, hear you, anybody. Mr. Hoover. We, we can, can hear you. Okay. Oh, I'm I'm going to give it a go. All right. Uh, okay. I've lived in uh, Continental Villas uh, for 15 years, and I'm going to be uh, I'm uh, uh, right behind uh, the uh, project uh, on Ellis Drive, and a couple of concerns that I have is the traffic down uh, Price Road uh, going to Baseline. I don't know if you've traveled that road lately, but it's like a speedway uh, coming down Price Road. And uh, my next door neighbor got T-boned there coming out of our alley. And I checked with the uh, 2020 traffic report from the traffic from uh, on uh, Price Road from uh, Southern to uh, Baseline, and the the traffic on that particular was in uh, September 19 uh, September 25 1920. The traffic was 12,000 cars in one day. 40% of the traffic occurred in the morning, and 60% traffic occurred after six o'clock. And then on Baseline and Price, uh, the traffic uh, combined east and west traffic is around 80,000 cars uh, in both directions. The other issue I have is the um, turning left onto uh, baseline off of ba out of Bala is that uh, you know, we've had that, that ability to turn left and uh, and I, I'd just like to uh, see if they're, I'm not sure all the variations that you're dealing with on how to handle that. The U-turn on any, doing any U-turn on baseline is extremely dangerous. And um, that's my comments. I'm opposed okay. to the project. <laughs> and uh, thank okay. you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hoover. Ms. Dasgupta, who else do we have? Speaker, Chairman. I'm sorry? Oh, is oh, that the last speaker? Is Matt Smith. Okay. Mr. Smith, are you with us? Um, 
I'm hearing some background chatter, and I'm suspecting that that is the uh, the line from Mr. Smith. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I unmuted it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, are you with us? <laughs> Looks like he stepped away to tend to his kids. All right. Well, it, it looks like he's not prepared to speak. So let's go ahead and move on then. Okay. So with that, we will close public comment and thank all those who participated. And let's come back to Ms. Manjula Vaz. Would you like to comment on those things that you've heard? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission, if possible, I, I would love to comment, but um, I'm gonna have Chuck Wright. Chuck, if you um, are unmuted, I think Chuck is the best to, Chuck can address Fremont, the traffic on Priest, and then I wanted Chuck to talk a little bit about um, the traffic that comes from retail, if this became single family, and if it became office. Chuck, or Joanna, is it possible to allow Chuck to speak? Sure, I think I'm on now. Can everybody yeah. hear me? Yes, thank you, Chuck. Okay, great. Uh, and for the record, my name is Chuck Wright with Kimley Hornet Associates, and I office at uh, 7740 North 16th Street in, in Phoenix. Um, I think I'll sort of take those questions in, in opposite order. Um, the question about the volumes on Baseline Road, uh, the most current adjusted volume, which we actually collected last winter, uh, which was a, two directions of, on Baseline Road just uh, west of Price Road, was approximately 35,000 cars a day. So uh, not clear where uh, uh, the 80,000 number might have come from, but uh, maybe it's it's reported as a different segment. But in this particular location, uh, it's in the 35,000 range. Uh, there was a question about seasonal adjustments and uh, adjustments for the, the special circumstances we are experiencing over the last year. Uh, we do uh, try to, to take counts in the wintertime when there are more average. Uh, a lot of the data that you see out on uh, uh, the, the, the county and ADOT have are adjusted for those factors. Uh, so we don't uh, typically count in the summertime and then use those volumes. If we do have to count in off-peak times, we'll adjust for that in, in our in our analysis. Uh, similarly, uh, with the, the the people staying at home recently, we have uh, made adjustments to account for that as well. And so the difference between the baseline road volumes when we uh, observed it and the typical uh, resulted in an adjustment factor of almost double. So we were using a significantly higher uh, volume in our analysis with an adjustment for the, for the pandemic than the actual volumes we observed. Uh, the question about the traffic volumes, I think, is is a is a worth a little bit of uh, additional discussion. Uh, the, the the site plan that we're proposing generates uh, around fourteen hundred trips a day for the for the multifamily units. Uh, we did some some comparisons to uh, basically the existing shopping center, and the shopping center is going to generate about three thousand. Uh, trips per day in compared to the 200 uh, uh, multifamily units. Uh, so what's on the site today were fully occupied again would be a significantly higher daily traffic uh, generator than, than what we're proposing uh, for, with this site plan. Uh, the uh, trips for the for the Multifamily is a little bit more evenly spread out in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, the shopping center is heavier in the afternoon and lower in the morning. Uh, we also looked at a couple other, you know, comparisons, uh, a potential, you know, office only develop, redevelopment of that parcel uh, would generate around 15 to 1600 trips a day. And uh, a similar number of single family homes, if we were just to compare it to, uh, you know, other portions of the neighborhood, if there were single family homes of you know 200, that would generate around 1,900 trips a day. So in comparison of those you know three different uh, land use scenarios, uh, the multifamily is actually the lowest of, of the four. 
we also did take a, a, a look at the alternate routes uh, based upon potential congested times on, on McClintock. And you know, that's really the uh, situation in the afternoon uh, when people would be returning to the project. And the total number of trips that are returning to this multifamily project in the afternoon is, is projected to be around 70. Um, and that's from all directions within, you know, the potential employment locations that, that the residents of these multifamily units uh, would likely be coming from. Uh, we, you know, you saw in, in some of the exhibits with what we showed as approximately 20 trips coming in from the from the west on Baseline Road. And that was all of the trips that we uh, anticipated would be coming uh, from the west and, and the northwest and, and the southwest uh, coming into the development. Uh, certainly a portion of those could consider alternate routes and, and Fremont would be a, an option. Uh, Fremont's kind of a unique street because it's a, a local street that extends almost a mile uh, between uh, McClintock and, and Price Road's southbound frontage road. Uh, so our expectation is it would probably be no more than, you know, five or, or ten of those uh, trips would likely find that to be a potential alternative route. And, and that works out to be generally around one additional vehicle every 10 minutes during that peak hour. So the, the there's certainly some some conditions along Fremont uh, that are a function of the, the configuration of that existing roadway uh, that the, the neighbors have been uh, working with the city on over the years. Uh, but our analysis doesn't indicate that this project would be generating a, a significant increase in any potential traffic through there. Um, and certainly the other uses that could come in um, at, uh, you know, the same site would generate uh, more traffic than, than the multifamily one. Um, okay, Ms. Vaz, anything else anything that you wish to add? No, I, th I think, um, Mr. Chair, I think Chuck did a nice job responding to uh, those comments. Okay. We're happy, to, we're happy to talk more about traffic, but. Um, I did want to bring up one of the questions which I didn't hear directly responded to. Um, and that was Mr. Hoover's question, or, or rather comment, on U-turns on Baseline Road being dangerous. Uh, it does seem like we might be asking people to make a fair amount of those U-turns. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Well, I think um, we're not trying to make them make that many. Um, Chuck, do you want to talk a little bit about the width? I, I was just offering. I think in the protected left-hand turn scenario, um, we don't anticipate that many people will. If you want to go to Bali, you may make that U-turn. Um, some are making them now, but um, the the way I can't show, but the way the a Continental Villas they have rear entry garages. So if you are traveling from the west and going east, you can travel to River, and then you can access the back of Donner those units kind of from River or Bala. So I guess you can travel through the alley, similar actually to the neighborhood I live in. Um, so I wasn't trying to op offer that people should make a bunch of U-turns. I was just giving you options as to where it could go. You could also, you know, while we are having a gated community, there's there's a way to pull into the apartment complex and potentially, you know, make that turn within that kind of little circle and then make a right onto baseline and go right into Bala. Um, depending on how you want to make it. It's, you know, do I think it's the, you know, it, it, it is an option when you, when um, there don't, we don't want any traffic on Bala. Unfortunately, there are some constraints that you give to try to cut to try off that traffic on Bala. But I don't know, Chuck, if you want to answer a little bit about the width of the road and the U-turns, because you have a better sense of that. Yeah, I think I would just add that, you know, certainly, there's instances where U-turns are prohibited um, because vehicles are unable to successfully execute um, the, the, the left turn, U-turn maneuver uh, because there's not enough width. And so you'll often see uh, intersections uh, where the, there's just two lanes and a significant number of vehicles just can't make that turn. Uh, we don't have that challenge here because there are the, the three, uh, sorry, three westbound lanes on Baseline Road. So we'd anticipate that uh, not uh, semi-tractor trailers, but uh, 
predominantly passenger cars wouldn't have any issue being able to execute that maneuver. Uh, the volumes, as as Manjula suggested, are are relatively low, uh, and there are a number of people that are executing left turns at the intersection today. Uh, so there's certainly the ability to there are gaps to be able to make the left turns. The U turns take a little bit longer, uh, but uh, we we don't think that there's going to be a dramatic. Uh, increase in the in the demand and and there are multiple locations if you didn't want to make the U-turn at an unsignalized location as, as at the main entrance uh, there's certainly other signals where you could do that as well and those signals provide gaps for people to be able to get across the traffic safely. Okay. Fair enough. All right, uh, Commission. Any other questions for our applicant? Okay, seeing none, we will thank you, Ms. Vaz. All right, Commission, what are your thoughts on price and baseline roads? Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Commission. Oh, I think Commissioner Amorosi's hand may be a leftover. Commissioner no, no, I was, I want I did have a question, but go ahead. Don can go okay. first. Oh, thank you, Phil. Uh, my is a quick question, uh, and mostly directed at the staff. Uh, in working with ADOT um, on the turning uh, the baseline road configurations, uh, is there a preference that the city has, or are we le most leaving that up to ADOT to make that final determination? Um, Chair and Commissioner Cassano, I would like to defer to Captain Hollow um, with the Transportation Division to respond mm -hmm. to that question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hi. Good evening. Um, Kathy Hollow. I'm the City Traffic Engineer. Um, we think that um, a couple of the options would work. Uh, we have some of our concerns were making sure that we didn't impact the property on the south side of baseline. So um, I, I think that's why when we talked with ADOT, they came up with a couple of those other options farther down that had looked a little complicated with all the left turns going in and out, but seemed to offer solutions for everybody. Uh, Karen, I don't have the uh, three, what the numbers of the alternatives are in front of me, but um, yeah, I, it, the city, um, it, it, it's not necessarily for ADOT to work out, but I don't know that we have a strong preference either way. We're, waiting to hear what the neighbors have to say. Um, the, the, the median, the big long median with the left turn pockets, seem, like I said, seems to help a lot of people. Um, but it does look a little um, funny when you first look at it. So. Is that, is that a, and just, Kathy, would that be a number four? Option I four? I think so. Um, mm -hmm. I, I honestly don't, I don't have them in front of me. I don't. Right. It's, it had. Uh, it's, it's it's more complex look, when you look at yes, it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it does, it, it does help. I think. Well, I think it addresses most every movement. Though a couple of them were U turns, but I think they were a small number mm -hmm. uh, that would make that movement. So. Um, okay. I think we. Were uh, thank you very much. And this goes back to uh, the staff again. Um, are we going to finalize that movement? or that, that traffic uh, option tonight as part of this, or are we just granting the request for the change in use? Uh, Chair and Commissioner, um, approval mm -hmm. or denial of this request would not impact design of that median. Okay. Um, so that's for future. Um, yeah, we, we don't have purview over um, right-of-way design. Mm -hmm. So um, again, you know, um, Catherine was just trying, she's in attendance right. obviously to answer questions, but also to, you know, hear the community's um, mm -hmm. feedback on the design and in working with ADOT to finalize that. So this is not part of our decision and we will not be making that as part of our motion to whatever decision Correct. we make. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Amorosi. Thank you, uh, Chairman Line. Uh, Obviously, it seems like traffic and parking are, are the two big issues. And uh, I think the developer, by uh, not having any access along this, the neighborhood streets, 
uh, I don't see how the residents, it would be to their advantage to cut through the neighborhood. I think they will stick to the main streets where they can go faster. Uh, but th with the parking thing, uh, it seems like my understanding is that the staff was willing to go down from 392 spaces to 362 spaces. And then the, uh, the developer was able to find, uh, move up from 332 to 355. So it, the difference between the 362 and the 355 is just seven spots short. So if the, and, and we should follow the rules, um, and it would seem like to me that you, the developer would just need to take off four units uh, at the most to bring them in compliance with the compromise that the city staff would want. Am I correct in my math? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Lines, if you don't mind, um, we've talked amongst ourselves and we're happy to go with the staff. We'll make the change and we'll go with the number of staff would like. So we'll, we'll fix it the way the condition reads in the report. So I just, I didn't want to, just so we can, just, I just want to respond to you if you don't mind. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut in to you, Commissioner Ambrosi. No, that's fine. That's, you, you answered the question. That's great. Uh, uh, okay, so yeah, that is a little unconventional, um, but I think we're on good terms, Ms. Vaz. Um, uh, but now I do want to follow up. Um, are you suggesting that you would look at removing units or that you would look to find those additional parking spaces? Or are you saying one way or another, we'd make sure that we satisfy the requirement from staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, again, I apologize for just breaking in, so I appreciate mm -hmm. your um, indulgence. Um, we will work with the staff. Karen has outlined, I believe, four ways that we can accomplish seven spaces. I believe that we can accomplish seven spaces by working through um, some of the landscaping and moving some of the parking spaces around. Um, but, you know, if we have to do, we'll work on the units. But I think there's some, as you know, there's, there's some site planning issues we can work through. We had worked through earlier. Some of them involve, we didn't want to, this may complicate the matter, but some of them involve moving the trash, uh, moving the trash receptacle a little bit. And so we need to talk to solid ways to talk about how to move trash as you know how that goes. Sometimes trash is leading your site plan. So there are options um, for us from a site plan because we do, you know, that we could impact our landscaping a little bit. We'll still have more landscaping. Um, and I think we'll make the site plan work, but we, after this, we have a little bit of time to work with the staff before we get to the council and to make sure we can make those numbers work. All right, fair enough. Uh, Commissioner Bauer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this has been a, this is a tough case for me. When you're when you're looking at a land use change in a general plan amendment, um, it to me it needs to have the impact, entire package addressed. The fact that, and I'm, I'm really surprised at this, the fact that the final baseline road configuration cannot be a part of this action uh, is concerning to me because I think that is the crux of this case. It's, it only has two points of access, ingress and egress. And, and while I understand why that is, and while I understand that that is more than likely an improvement given the number of curb cuts that exist on the price frontage road and baseline road respectively. Um, access is what has been uh, my concern with this, uh, with this project. At the outset, I will say the land use is not something that I uh, would oppose. The density is not something that I would propose. The design, the landscaping, everything seems to be in good order and well done but the access in particular what happens to access to bala for the neighborhood is is of critical importance to me and it seems like we've got a situation to where the uh, i guess it's number three which would be a single left turn pocket for access to the to the uh, apartment community which would block bala access 
is uh, supported by the, the uh, condominium association on the south and the commercial development on the south, uh, whether or not that's supported by the neighbors, it seems like it is not. I will say on the outset to that, that the, the fact that Continental Villas and Travelers on Bala have the ability to turn left on Baseline Road now, I do not think is a good idea at all. I, given the amount of traffic that we have in Tempe, the lack of medians and, and movement restrictions, I think is a hazard in and of itself. Um, I believe there are other opportunities to get to both of these neighborhoods on the north side of Baseline Road uh, without using BALA. And, and I don't really see that as a major hindrance to the neighborhood. Um, they may, uh, but, but I do not. So I, I'm concerned that, that we don't know what this is going to look like and what it's going to do to the entire community because that's what we're here to look at the south side, the north side, the neighborhood, the commercial development that exists. Uh, those are simply simply my comments. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Bauer. Commissioner Sunders. Thanks so much. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Commissioner Bauer there on so many of those points. Um, it just seems that there's still quite a bit of work to be done. Um, we have a case where we're, we're being asked effectively to increase the number of units or allow an increase of almost doubling the number of units. And we've got a lot of folks in the neighborhood who took the time to write letters, who took the time to be on the call here with us today and speak their mind. And I expected when I heard, uh, when I saw a petition, I expected a page. Um, there was a lot more than just one page and it wasn't some change.org online petition you can sign multiple times. It's two or 300 people uh, door to door signing a petition in a pandemic. And that's pretty compelling. Um, it just feels like there's a lot more work that needs to be done here. And the density is, uh, is, a, is a big change and traffic concerns are very real in this location. So those are my challenges with this one. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, Commission? Commissioner Schwartz. I, I really appreciate the time and effort that this team has taken over the past year. It sounds like there was a lot of back and forth but between the adjacent community and um, it, in looking at the site plan, uh, you know, I think the density um, matches some some of what we need in this in this area and by their ability to take the two story volumes next to the homes and including quite a bit of landscape buffer. I'm very appreciative of that thoughtful design there. Um, you know, I think looking at some of the access issues and if we're able to talk through some of that additionally um, with transportation, I think that's the big concern I have as well. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, comments? Okay, so I'll chime in. Um, yeah, I, I share some of the concerns. Um, you know, I, I'm very much on the same page as Commissioner Amorosi regarding the parking. Um, I think it's, you know, sometimes we extend some lenience to try to meet a project part way, and I, I like that city staff said, hey, we'll meet you at a deficit of 30 parking spaces. Um, but I do think that they do need to get to that. I appreciate that the applicant has said they will work to make sure that they do satisfy those requirements. Um, I share the concern on access. Uh, my belief though is that the project will not go forward without uh, transportation uh, agreeing to the solution that, that comes up. Um, so I'm not sure that I view it as, as our peer purview to solve that uh, requirement here. I believe that we're uh, requiring it to be solved with staff. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, I, I'm really grateful to see so many people get involved <clears throat> and, and say, hey, we, we do not like this project. Um, I, I think uh, this is the most common comment that I've seen in my time on the, the commission is um, this is too much being added, too many new cars, too much traffic, too many homes. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate that sentiment. Um, in this case, I think 
the reality is, uh, as with so many cases we've seen before, this is actually a reduction from what that site would be if it was really hopping. If that commercial center was, was really operating the way it was intended, there would be many, many more cars than you will have if this becomes this residential development. Um, so I think it is an, an improvement in that, those terms. I certainly think we need the housing with the rate at which uh, we've been growing and the influx of people and the skyrocketing price of homes. Uh, I think more apartments are sorely needed. So I think in a number of ways, this is really a good project. I do think there are some real concerns to be worked through and I have confidence in staff to work through those. Um, so I will be supporting the project. Um, having said that, do we have any more comments or shall we have a motion? I will entertain a motion if there is one. Okay, I will press for a motion then. Will someone please give us a motion? Mr. Chair, uh, Phil Amorosi, I make a motion to approve the price and baseline roads PL200239. Uh, that includes the GPA 200004, the zoning uh, amendment 20003, the PAD 20004, and the DPR 200120. Okay, so thank you, Commissioner Amorosi. Very quickly, um, I have two things. Um, Commissioner Schwartz, I see your hand. Is there something else that you wish to, wish to, no? Okay, I see you waving me off. And I heard a voice, did I hear Ms. Duskupta or someone else chiming in? Yes, Chairman, just to uh, remind Commissioner Am Amorosi to include the revised um, stipulations as proposed by the applicant. Uh, except for the number of parking spaces from 30 to 37 and all the other revisions, if there could be something to that uh, effect. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Gastupra. Um, yes, I, I want to amend the uh, motion to include that the applicant uh, will work with staff to bring up uh, to match the parking spaces and to work with uh, traffic to, uh, to address those concerns. And um, uh, that that all depends on them working that out to uh, approve the uh, development. Okay. Is that okay? I think we understand that to include all these stipulations as Ms. Descoupta described. Uh, thank you. Do I hear a second on that motion? I will second, Mr. Johnson. Okay, motion to approve with conditions as outlined by staff, uh, as outlined by Ms. Descoupta and seconded by Commissioner Johnson. Uh, let me get up here real quick. I apologize. Commissioner Bauer, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Kasana. Aye. Commissioner Schwartz. Aye. I vote aye as well. Commissioner Summers. Nay. Commissioner Amorosi. Aye. And Commissioner Johnson. Aye. Okay, the motion passes six to one with Commissioner Sumner's in dissent. All right, so thank you everyone. So with that, let's move on to our final piece of business, which is Mill House. And uh, Ms. Vaz, you, you suggested that someone else would be presenting and I forget who, did you say Rob? <laughs> Mr. Do we Chairman, have that person with us? Oh, we do, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, thank you for your time. Uh, Rob Lane from my office will be presenting Mill House Millhouse project along with Marty Ball, who's our architect from CCBG. Thank you. Good evening, Chair right. and Commissioners. Rob Lane, Senior Land Use Planner with Yamage and Burnham, and thank you, Jason, for pulling up the presentation. Address for the records 40 North Central Avenue in Phoenix. We represent Millhouse, the developer of the proposed project we'll be discussing. 
Uh, with me this evening, as you know, is Modula Vaz of Gamage and Burnham, Brad Vogelsmeyer of Millhouse, and Martin Ball of CCBG Architects. Next slide, please. We have a technical problem there. Uh, looks like something's happening with this file. Uh, wait one moment, please, while I try to address the issue. Okay. 26. 26. There we go. Thank you, Jason. Is everyone still able to hear me? Millhouse is a yeah, uh, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Millhouse is a development, construction, and property management company based in Indianapolis that specializes in Class A urban multifamily residential buildings. Millhouse works in urban cores and develops high-quality projects with unique and interesting design characteristics. Millhouse's portfolio currently includes 33 mixed use and multifamily residential projects across 10 states. On this slide are photographs of Millhouse's developments in Indianapolis, Oklahoma City, and Kansas City, and a rendering of an approved development that Millhouse is uh, building in North Tempe. Next slide, please. The property is located um, approximately 100 feet east of River Drive along the Apache Light Rail Line and is comprised of eight parcels totaling approximately four and a half acres in size. Next slide. The property currently consists of an automobile service repair shop, an unoccupied commercial building, a short-term recreational vehicle and trailer park, and a few single family homes. Next slide. The surrounding area consists of a mix of public transportation, lodging, employment, and existing and planned commercial and residential uses including the light rail line within the median of Apache Boulevard, the two-story roadway in at the immediate southeast corner of Apache and River, the approved mixed-use cul-de-sac development consisting of several three-story buildings at the southwest corner of Apache and River, the four-story river at East Line Village housing development at the northeast corner of Apache and River, the four-story Meridian at 101 senior housing development uh, across uh, Apache to the northeast of the site, and the fourth story with Lofts Metro 101 mixed use development at the southwest corner of Apache Enterprise Road. Next slide, please. In order to accommodate the redevelopment of the project, we are requesting a zoning map a amendment to rezone the property to MU4 TOD, a PAD overlay to establish site specific development standards, a use permit to allow a limited amount of tandem parking spaces, and a development plan review for the project's design. Next slide. The proposed development is a high quality modern mixed use project comprised of a four story mixed use building along the Apache frontage, a four story multifamily residential building along the River Drive and Wildermuth Avenue frontages, 219 multifamily residential units consisting of a mix of studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom units, and five live work units along the Apache frontage, a coffee shop along the Apache frontage, and a resident lobby and leasing office. Next slide. The proposed development also features numerous amenities for residents and guests, 260 on-site parking spaces, of which 48 are within private garages and 133 are covered, 212 bicycle spaces, and significant landscape enhancements. Next slide. This time I'm going to turn it over to Marty Ball with CCBG Architects to discuss the site and architectural design. Marty. Good evening, members of the Commission. Thank you for uh, uh, hearing our case this evening. Uh, my name is Martin Ball. I'm with CCBG Architects. We're located at 102 East Buchanan in downtown Phoenix. Uh, I'll point out, beginning at the upper right-hand corner, a few points uh, about our design this evening. Uh, beginning at the upper right, uh, we feature lived work units uh, and a coffee space, uh, coffee shop space along Apache Boulevard uh, to satisfy our frontage uh, concerns along the corridor position 
uh, adjacent to light rail. Immediately to the south of our frontage on Apache, uh, you can see the position of our clubhouse. That is our resident entry and amenity space. Uh, below, you'll see a note uh, for bicycle parking. We have bicycle parking spread throughout our community, both indoor and outdoor, uh, for both residents and for visitors. We uh, provide 212 bicycle parking spaces, uh, 80 of which are at the interior of the building, along with the Fix-It shop uh, and uh, pump station for uh, the public outside of our parking courtyard. A few notes about our amenity spaces. We offer a pool and a spa uh, immediately to the south of our primary frontage on Apache in a protected uh, courtyard area. Uh, we have a turf lawn and ramada area, uh, as well as uh, additional bicycle parking adjacent to uh, the turf and lawn area. Uh, going further down the list, uh, we show the position at the southeast corner of our building for our indoor bicycle repair room and storage for bicycles. That's intended for residents. Below that, we have a loading position, uh, one of two on the site, one within our parking courtyard and one along the river frontage uh, on the west side of our site. One of the unique features on this particular site is that we uh, plan to construct a four-story type 5A wood frame structure with tuck under private garages uh, within the structure itself. Uh, at the lower left-hand uh, corner, you'll see a position noting the loading space for residents to move in and move out along River Drive, as well as a notch in our south building where we have a street-facing entry. This will be the most convenient place for those residents choosing to take their last mile from the light rail stop on skateboard uh, at that uh, southwest corner at River and Wildermuth. Our parking courtyard is at the center of our property. Uh, we have seven tandem spaces, and this is the subject of a uh, revision to the stipulation that we'll hear about in a few moments from staff. Uh, the condition here is a garage that is indoor as well as a space that is outdoor in tandem position. So intended to be uh, dedicated to someone who gets two parking spaces. Uh, next, you'll see uh, bicycle parking uh, immediately adjacent to the southwest corner of our north building. And then along our west property line, uh, a dog park, uh, and also a little farther to the north, game lawn, barbecue grills, uh, and a note uh, that we are again uh, constructing a four-story mixed-use building. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, you can see here along our Apache frontage, we wanted to point out the position and the scale of our, our live-work units. Uh, these are based on two-bedroom units. One of the bedroom spaces is given over to a live-work condition with direct access from the street and from the sidewalk along Apache. Thus, we have a one-bedroom live-work above street level, a two-bedroom unit. The coffee shop is immediately on the corner uh, at the northwest of our north building. And we'll see that in this next slide, which shows us a 3D view. There we go. Uh, this is the northeast corner of our building. Uh, and as we do not control the uh, intersection at River and Apache, uh, we have moved our vehicular entrance to the east side of our site and we have fronted the coffee shop right onto Apache. You can see an awning and an address at the position where you'll walk into the coffee shop. And then uh, immediately below the flagpole, uh, there is an entrance into the resident amenities. Next slide, please. Here we see the southwest corner of River and Wildermuth. So this is building number two. Uh, and it illustrates the deep notch uh, in the river drive facade that we've created to help reduce the scale of this L-shaped building. We've done a number of things here with the height of our parapets, as well as uh, the material articulation of our building to really break down the mass uh, of this L-shaped building. Next slide, please. 
Uh, here we'd like to feature for you uh, a couple of notes. We propose to uh, provide parallel parking along both River and Wilderness that is part of our uh, 16 spaces as part of our overall parking uh, provided to both residents and to guests. You can also see in this image uh, we have five two-bedroom units that have direct walkout to sidewalk access uh, featured from their balconies. And you can see some of the doors there. Next slide. Here we are at the extreme southeast corner of our south building. This uh, illustrates the parallel parking condition, which we feel is a, is a great uh, addition to the sidewalk uh, experience as you uh, approach the building and take that last mile. Uh, to your home from the light rail stop. Uh, parallel parking adjacent to a landscaped sidewalk uh, is, is an important uh, um, aspect of developing a functional uh, and shaded pedestrian environment for us on this, uh, this site. We also see right at the uh, uh, right-hand side, the south exit from our parking courtyard onto Wildermuth. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next two slides illustrate a little bit about the pedestrian character that we're trying to create. Uh, this slide takes place on our Apache frontage, where we have live-work units with direct access to the sidewalk in the public way. Uh, uh, to illustrate that, uh, we see someone approaching the doors to a live-work unit, uh, and also, uh, uh, of course, meeting City of Tempe standards for our uh, shaded pedestrian environment along our Apache frontage. Next slide, please. Here uh, we see at the south end of our site a similar condition with perhaps a less intense uh, frontage to deal with. This is on Wildermuth. And you can see an illustration of a uh, car parallel parking along the south edge of our project, a space that is landscaped so that you can open your door without uh, interfering with sidewalk uh, access our eight foot sidewalk, and then once again, a landscape buffer before you uh, approach the building. Next slide. I'll hand this back over to Rob to complete the presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Marty. And just, and just quickly, and since we have a use permit request, we just wanted to quickly go um, over the uh, approval criteria. As we mentioned, we have a limited amount of uh, tandem parking spaces, uh, which Marty described in terms of 14 total spaces with seven of those spaces being within um, single vehicle private garages and then seven of the spaces being within dr the driveways in front of those garages. Um, we certainly believe that the request uh, satisfies um, the criteria for approval and uh, will not cause a significant amount of traffic uh, on adjoining areas or any nuisance exceeding ambient conditions. Next slide, please. We also feel that the uh, that the tandem parking will actually in the project overall will improve and encourage additional investment in the area will further the goals objectives and policies of the city will be compatible with surrounding structures and uses and will not result in any disruptive behavior. Next slide. In regard to outreach, we did provide notice for and held a neighborhood meeting. There was three neighbors which attended the meeting. We also presented the uh, project to uh, citizens for a vibrant Apache corridor. Uh, the CVAC members that were in attendance generally indicated that the project would be an improvement for the area and express support. Next slide. Lastly, and in closing, I did want to mention that we are in agreement with the approval conditions being recommended uh, by staff with the clarification to uh, development plan review condition number 13 that I believe D Diana will be discussing in her presentation. And certainly want to thank staff for all their time and efforts uh, working with us on this project. Um, and with that, we're happy to address any questions you may have. And thank you for your time and consideration this evening. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Commission, questions for our applicant? Okay, I don't think we have any questions for you at this time, gentlemen, so we'll thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kaminsky, are you with us? Hello, I'm here. 
Can Jason put up the staff presentation for us? Thank you. Commissioners and Chairman Lyon, this is Diana Kaminsky, Senior Planner with the City of Tempe Community Development Department. The Millhouse request is for the zoning map amendment to change the zoning on the south side of Apache Boulevard from what's currently two zoning classifications, the CSS Commercial, which fronts Apache, and the R4, which fronts the Wildermuth side. This is a through lot. And as Rob explained, it also has adjacency to River Drive with the exclusion of the corner lot, which is the roadside inn. Uh, they would be proposing to go from MU to MU4 in the transportation overlay district corridor with a planned area development for 219 units and five live work units with the 590 square foot restaurant space along the street frontage. The use permit for seven tandem parking spaces in the driveways of seven of the the garages and the development plan review for the design. Next slide, please. This shows the chart of the comparison for the proposed PAD and the development standards. There was also a table within your report that compared to other projects within the area that have been built with entitlements. So their proposed density of 49 dwelling units per acre is in character with the area. Their height of 58 feet is also in character with the area. They are decreasing the maximum lot size area um, with a slight decrease for the landscape area and they're increasing and decreasing setbacks depending on which street frontage you're on. And they are not proposing any changes to the parking standards within the TOD corridor. Next slide, please. The use permit uh, standard, I'm not going to go through all these criteria. We did do a, an evaluation of this. It is kind of a unique project in that it offers both surface parking that is covered as well as um, individual garage units for some of the residents. And um, I'll go into that condition at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So the site plan shows the overall site and I wanted to point out if, if Jason can put his cursor in the center of the site where the two boxes are juxtaposed. I don't know if there's a way of zooming in on that. Maybe not. Um, on the actual site plan, sorry, Jason. There you go. Those are the seven units. Um, maybe move your cursor back and forth so people can see. Okay. Those are the seven units we're talking about with regard to the use permit and the, they have a driveway configuration in front of them. Next slide, please. The landscape here is broken into the north end and south end to show you where the trees are located. They have a double row of trees um, shading the pedestrian walkways on all of the street frontages. Oh, I apologize, on the Apache and the Riverside and then a single tree configuration on the south side of the sidewalk on Wildermuth. So they're adding a significant amount of tree shade value to this area with three streets being impacted by the development. Next slide, please. And they went over, Martin went over the elevation, so I won't go into the details of all the materials there. Next slide, please. And next slide. These are the street elevations on the three frontages that they have. Next slide. And the renderings, which you've seen most of these already. Next slide. So they did have a neighborhood meeting um, and they also reached out to the CVAC with a separate meeting um, April 26th of this year. Um, at the meeting that I attended, there were eight members of the public, um, excuse me, there were eight members for the CVAC meeting. And at the neighborhood meeting, they had three members of the public attend. Um, there was one that was concerned about the RV park and where the tenants of the RV park would go. So I wanted to point out that this is a recreational vehicle, not permanent housing condition. Um, the, the park in, in question here is temporary for camping. Um, I also received a call from the automotive shop tenant who was concerned about the timing of this and the location of the sign for the notification of the hearing. He didn't want his customers to think he was closed during this process. Um, and those were, those were his primary concerns was the scheduling of, of the case. Next slide, please. 
We are recommending approval subject to conditions and the applicant has reviewed the conditions. There is one unique condition that we wanted to clarify. We have a standard condition that refers to the interior space of, of garages so that we have enough room for pedestrians to exit a car and get to the door of their unit or in the case of a, a garage door to get out. Um, in this situation, we have the interior of the garages are, are very generous. In, in some cases, they look like tandem spaces, but they are a single car garage. So we wanted to clarify the, the requirements of a single vehicle garage along with the requirements of a standard parking space and an external condition like a driveway which is the 18 feet by eight and a half so that's what this condition was kind of expanded upon to give that unique condition of the driveway depth as well as the garage depth even though some of these garages are deeper than that so they provide more room for storage within the garages themselves and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for taking us through that condition. Uh, Commission, any questions for Ms. Kaminsky? Okay, well, thank you then. Thank you. All right, so I believe we do not have public comment on this case. Is that correct, Ms. Duskupta? That is correct, Chairman. Okay. So let's come back to our applicant. Um, if you wish to make further comment on what you've heard or, or what Ms. Kaminsky has said to us or other things you just wish to touch on, you are welcome to do so now. Uh, we don't have anything to add, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, we appreciate Diana's clarification on the uh, condition pertaining to the uh, garage dimensions and tandem driveways and are um, in agreement with it. Okay. Commission, any last questions for our applicant? Okay, well, I will just say uh, thank you for presenting the case, gentlemen. I think we were all pretty favorably impressed that we felt this is a, a good project that we should have you present so that it can be on record and we can all see it, public can see it. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to present it. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Cassano. Commissioner Cassano, did you have a question or comment? Um, are you ready for an, a uh, motion? I don't think we're there quite yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Amorosi. Thank you, Chairman Lyon. I, I just wanted to go on record saying how, uh, how I really like this project. Uh, I'm glad it's taken out a, a vacant parcel that's been there vacant for decades and two auto uses which were basically grandfathered in before the the zoning change so uh this is definitely an improvement uh they are double the density of the last project and yet they have more parking than what is required which was great compared to the last project. <laughs> and uh and it it butts up to uh, an industrial area. And what I'm hoping is that the people that work in that area will utilize this now. They'll have a place where they can just walk right across the street from where they live and, and work. And the fact that they do have some live work units on Apache, uh, I think that's gonna be uh, a big thing in the future uh, after the pandemic. So uh, I'm definitely going to support this and uh, it's a nice compliment going along with the cul-de-sac project to the west. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? If not, we can go to a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion for approval of the Millhouse project at uh, PL210034. Uh, okay. With conditions is that on by staff? Yes, staff? with conditions, yes, as discussed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do I hear a second? Uh, second it, Commissioner Sumner. Okay. Motion to approve with commission uh, with uh, conditions as outlined by staff uh, from Commissioner Casano and seconded by Commissioner Summers. Commissioner Bauer, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Casano. Aye. Commissioner Schwartz. 
I. I vote I as well. Commissioner Sumners? Aye. Commissioner Amorosi? Aye. And Commissioner Johnson? Aye. All right, that motion passes 7-0. Thank you, Commission. And thank you to all of our applicants and presenters and to those who joined us online and took the time to make comment. We're glad that you're all involved and we're glad to be part of this discussion together to improve our city. So with that, uh, we'll ask Ms. Dasgupta if she wishes to give us an update on our next meeting on the, uh, let's see, 22nd. Chairman and commission members, the next meeting is tw on June 22nd. Uh, the study session will start at 515. Uh, we have two presentations during that study session, a character area plan for Papago North Tempe area, as well as a code text amendment um, just to the zoning code for some clarifications and corrections. Then uh, for the regular agenda, uh, we have two cases uh, for that uh, night. The first one is uh, a request for an use permit to increase the building height from 35 to 38.5 feet in GID at a development plan review for a develop office building at 1535 West Elna Ray Street for car graphing. And then um, the second one is a PAD with a DPR for an existing office building uh, plus a new story, two, two, new three-story office buildings and two parking structures for Carvana on 1275 West Rio Salado Parkway. Okay, thank you. Um, I will add just one announcement. Uh, which is to thank Mr. Dalton Garrett for his service to the city of Tempe. He's announced that he is moving on and this is his last meeting with us here. So we wish you good luck, Dalton, and we thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, sorry, Mr. Abramson. Thank you, Commissioner Lyon. I just want to thank you uh, and Commissioner Johnson for your service to the city. This is both uh, Commissioner Johnson's and Chair Lyon's last meeting uh, with the Development Review Commission. However, Mr. Lyon uh, continues to be the chair of the Board of Adjustment and I look forward to uh, continuing to work with Mr. Lyon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Abramson. I, uh, I'm gonna admit that I'm a little surprised. I actually thought that our 22nd meeting was my last. Was this, in fact, my last meeting? No, the 22nd, June 22nd is the last one, Chairman. <laughs> okay. Okay. I apologize. So, I retired you early. <laughs> I bet that was a shot. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the sentiment anyway, Steve. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll just play that one again two weeks from now. Uh, all right, everyone. Uh, this has been a good meeting, and we thank you. And we are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.